look a lot more in our way of thinking. You know, we grab all of those things that look to be okay by our standard and we say, okay, that, that seems to be working out all right for me. I'll take that. And we forget, we, we ignore all the other parts that the Bible is actually saying, this is also for you. As a pastor, it took me a long time to actually get to that point. You might sort of think it's like, you know, well, you're a pastor, isn't it? You've sort of like you know, had a call on your life. You get into God's word. You study it deeply. You're there to talk about it and proclaim it. But it's a different thing of knowing a thing and walking a thing, isn't it? And something of God sort of came into my life. I reckon he took a 4B2 and uh, knocked me silly. It was 15 years ago and here I was in the cardiac ward on a good Friday morning and I, Evan, I kicked my last. I was there, and thanks be to doctors who happened to be there in the cardiac ward, talking about being in the right place at the right time, because this wasn't a heart attack. It wasn't even uh, anything anatomically that they could have just, uh, by someone jumping up and down my chest and getting me back to, you know, here I am again. It was, they have a name for it, but even the, even the doctors, after they'd done all the tests on it, so I'm written up in some journal as, you know, patient X or something. But um, they, <laughs> but I was still wired with all of the things on then when uh, I had an experience that the doctor called six sinus syndrome, or rather the electrical system, as I call it, blew a fuse. Boom. You know, and I was dead. And I had a glimpse of heaven. And I was there. And I can tell you that it's exciting and amazing what is awaiting for us. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. Because that in itself would be amazing because the Bible actually promises us. And Jesus even said, I'm in John chapter 14, he says, I'm going to go ahead of you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when it's done, I'm going to come back and take you to be where I am so that you will be with me forever. And I think I saw a little glimpse of just the entrance hall because the place was too grand for me. It was like, you know, I'm sort of thinking, yeah, looks pretty awesome. Thank you, God, if that's the sort of place that I'm going to be waiting for, that's uh, pretty awesome. But it kind of like I think it was just the place where God is just inviting us into heaven. And I reckon if I would have taken another step further on, I wouldn't be here to tell you the story. But... I think Penny had something to do with it. She sort of prayed and sort of said, God, uh uh. <laughs> he needs to come back here. So um, here I am, thanks to Penny. <laughs> but, and Jesus, of course, <laughs> Jesus had no say in it because there was an angel who came past and said, whispered into his ear, and he looked at me and sort of said, Oh, because see, there were a few other things there that, you know, says, hey, little will be waiting for you when you return. So here I woke up. And then the doctors um, looked at the, my situation and said, you're not going out of this hospital until we put a pacemaker in you. So it's not a pacemaker. There's a different one. It doesn't actually, you know, it hasn't sort of burnt out my, my node, is it? Whatever it is that's, you know, has an electrical thing. It just monitors it. And when it goes down low, I've got my own jumper leads. So... If you kind of see me, you know, you know, jerking around, it's because, you know, the heart is sort of like kicking in and so we're saying, no, nah, it's not going to happen. But once I had that in here and I had a couple of interesting experiences, not just of heaven, but when I woke up, my first opening of the eyes, this side of eternity again, and God spoke into my life very clearly as if he was standing right next to me. And he said, greater is he who is in you than he is in the world. That's First John chapter 4, verse 4. I mean, it was really, really loud. So much so that that waking moment was very memorable to me with those words. It stayed with me all the way through. Because can you imagine having experienced a glimpse of heaven... And so if even as a pastor saying, who's going to believe me if I tell them? I know people that these days, there's lots of it around, you know, lots of heaven experience. But back in 15 years ago, hardly anybody. 
So it took a while for me to actually talk to Penny about it. But in between, I had these conversations with God saying, what was this all about? What was the point of this? And I even have this joking thing. I know that you can turn me off and on, but, you know, why? You know, born and Christmas, dies and Good Friday. It's like, you know, you sort of think, well, you know, no wonder God sent me back and said, pick your own day. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. <laughs> and, um, but the thing is that when, uh, when I had this prayer, God, what was this all about? What are you trying to teach me? Rather than speaking and saying, okay, this is what it's all about, he gave me two occasions when I saw angels all around me. And now I know as a pastor, year in, year out, come Christmas or come Good Friday, you know, we always talk about it, you know, in terms of Christmas and the angels and the shepherds. We have it, and it's cutesy kind of stuff. Or we have um, the situation around the, uh, the crucifixion and the ascension, and the angels are there to tell the disciples, he's not here, he's risen. You know, we, we have that. And we read over it, not recognizing that something really important is being shared with us that's actually also including us. In Hebrews chapter 1, we hear of something very important. Verse 14. Are not all angels, it doesn't say some, it says all. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Are you a saved person here? Who still needs to be saved? Let me talk to him later on. Because here's the interesting thing. We have a word from God. God's holy angels, all of his angels, are ministering among us, ministering angels sent by God to work among us, share with us for those that are going to be inheriting salvation. They are sent to serve. So these encounters with angels were very interesting because... The first time that I had an encounter with those angels was um, after the operation. I was sent home, and I was in bed, and we had uh, a few people, Penny's parents, come over. It was an afternoon, 4 o'clock. The sun was going down, you know, when you sort of like the afternoon sun was coming, streaming in the window. And uh, I was in bed, pillows up, awake. I had no um, medication because all that they did was just give me needles around it and it was already uh, a day or two after that, so I can't even put it down to kind of something was in my system. But the thing is, here I was in bed. They said, how are you doing? All okay, let's go and have a copy. So they went off into the living room. I was in my bed alone and I continued with this prayer that I had, God, what is this supposed to do? What am I supposed to do with it? It just kept on coming back, and then God allowed these angels to appear all around my bed. So it wasn't at night time, I wasn't dreaming, I wasn't coming out of a dream, I just had a conversation with people who then off they went and had a cup of coffee. And they all appeared around my bed, five of them. They were bigger, larger, full of energy, full of sparkle. I, I often liken it to, you know, the party sparklers? You know, when they sparkle, but just imagine a whole person full of sparkle, right? So they're full of energy. And the one on my right, on my bed, so it says to me, what instructions have you got for us? And I sort of said, instructions? If you want instructions, you go to God for instructions. I don't give you instructions. And he says, put out your hand. Now, put out my hand. I looked at his hand, I mean, anatomically the same, except full of this energy, not flesh and blood, but this, this spark, this power, this, this uh, divine stuff that was around them, right? I put my hand into his, I held it, and immediately I was speaking in an angelic language. And these words were coming out as I'm holding this um, angel's hand. And I hear from God saying, you know that I can give this gift to everyone and anyone that I want to. These are instructions for the angels. And it goes on, and he sort of says, they will understand what you are saying, but the devil has absolutely no idea what's going to happen. 
Right? So when we speak in English, when we pray our English prayer, not only do we have the angels waiting to hear it, but we also know that the demonic is there saying, oh, now I know what to put an obstacle against. Now I know what to sabotage. Now I know what to hinder and hurt and harm. As says in John chapter 14, oh no, John 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, destroy and deceive. But I've come to give you life and all its fullness. So we know that the thief is around there constantly trying to take our prayers and locking them away. How do we know that? Daniel. Daniel, for instance, he prayed. And you can read about it yourself. I won't, won't belabor the point. But the thing is, in that prayer that he prayed, he had to wait 21 days for the answer. And then when the angel finally came, he actually got told, God answered your prayer straight away. So as soon as we pray, we have God's yes and amen. We have his answer to us. But the delivery of that prayer took 21 days for the angel to get there. Now, why the delay? Why the waiting? Why? Do you know the story? What happened? Had a fight. The angels are fighting to get the answers to us. And we have opposition that is preventing them. So we are people of faith. Can you then imagine what we're doing to the angels when they are so committed to get the answer to us and we have to just have to wait a while and then after a while we sort of think, oh well, maybe God didn't want us to have that prayer and we switch off and turn our back onto that. And just then the angels come through and say, oh, and we miss it again and again. You know, this place that we have as people is a very interesting one because I think prayer is the interface between the things in heaven and the things of earth. And then when Jesus taught us to pray, he actually shared with us that insight. May your will be done, how? What? On earth as it is in heaven. The interface between those two are actually with you and with me. That's how important it is of what we do when we pray. And how important it is for those who have the gift of speaking in tongues to pray in tongues. You know, there was a study done in America many years ago um, coming out of more of the evangelical scene in terms of where people were desperate to get the gift of speaking in tongues because it was understood and seen and taught as a way of saying, now you know you have the Holy Spirit. You know, quite exotic. You can start to speak in tongues and therefore, obviously, you are special. You have the gift of speaking in tongues. You must have the Holy Spirit. Then this research was done of how many people who have had this gift um, continue it and for how long. And they have found a huge drop-off after three years. So desperate to have this wonderful gift and it only lasted for three years and then it was like ho-hum yesterday's news. And you know, I reckon it's because we don't understand what is it for. Why? If you understand that your prayer language, whether you speak it in English or whether you speak it in, in, in tongues, is actually mobilizing angels. The ministry of angels among us. You change the way that you pray. You change the way that the purpose of speaking in tongues is there for. Suddenly you realize if something is happening, and funny, you know, I'll tell you, um, Penny, the other day she said, do you realize I woke up um, and you were praying in sleep, in tongues? That is, just, this is strange for me. It's like, it's like, you know, I can pray in tongues in my thoughts, but also out loud, but I didn't ever hear that I'm actually doing it in my sleep as well. But the thing is that, here's an interesting thing, is that when God says, I need something done here on earth, who's in charge? Who does God put in charge of the things that have happened here on earth? You and me. So God is saying, I need someone to speak it out here so that the angels can bring it into and manifest it among us here. The angels have their realm, and we have our realm. And the interface is prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let's talk about angels. But before I do, I think it's very important for us just to have a pause here and pray 
because the thing is that we so often get many things wrong when, as soon as we talk about something exotic like ministry of angels. It's like, you know, do we pray to the angels? And all sorts of strange questions come up. And I'll get to some of those, hopefully. But I'll have a series on these so you can chew it in one after the other as I'm going to explore this ministry because it was something that was very important to me. But for a long time, I just kept it to myself. And I think it's really important for the church to know you are not on your own. When we pray, we have ministering angels all around us. So, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have released the host of heaven to work and walk among us. Holy angels, you are welcome here. And as we pray the words that God speaks to us and puts onto our heart, as we give voice to them, we give you permission to get busy. Let there not be a single angel that is unemployed and hanging around. Lord, let them all bring to, to fruition, bring to, into manifestation, bring into our awareness here in the physical realm the answers that God has already ordained and spoken for. So, Lord, you are the angels. You are the messengers. You are the bringers of the message of God. And that is the answers to the prayers that we have, as a church all around the world, have been speaking out. So now in this special time, as we have said, where all the churches everywhere are gathering around in prayer, heavenly hosts, would you give here, hearken to the prayers that have been spoken and become active doers of that which is proclaimed, that we may see miracles upon miracles, the hand of God at work, and that everybody around the world will have no doubt that all of what they see is from heaven above, from our Heavenly Father, and that everyone will give glory to His holy name. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And so what I want to say here is that actually Scripture acknowledges this ministry, both in the Old and in the New Testament. As we've had a few highlights here that it was at Jesus' ministry, you know, in terms of His birth already, that the angels showed up that they were there even in terms of his own battle. Remember when he was baptized and the Holy Spirit came upon him and the Holy Spirit then sent him out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, he did what? Battle against the devil. Sometimes we sort of think that, you know, some of the times that we have, uh, you know, long, hard but he did 40 days of battle. Some theologians actually say that is where the entire battle was won. Everything else is just a, an outworking of that in terms of going to the cross. And so, it's like sealing all of the victory that was done so that that victory against the devil is forever. He is gone. And so the interesting thing, when he had finished, I don't, don't want to go in and look at the, the battles that he had to do because they themselves are very interesting. We'll get to that on another time when I look more into that. But the thing is that when he finished, guess what? Angels came and ministered to him. There are so many uh, events that we start to see how important the angels were and what was actually happening. Do you realize that, for instance... Uh, going back to Christmas, we have the shepherds, and the sheep, and all that sort of kind of stuff, the angels announcing it to the shepherds. Do you realize who those shepherds were and who those sheep were that they were tending and keeping watch over? They were the sheep that were prepared by the set, set, set aside by the temple for the sacrifice. They watched, kept watch over the sacrificial lambs that were going to be used the very next few days in the temple court. They were special shepherds assigned to keep watch over those very important sheep. And the angels then came to those shepherds were assigned for the lambs that were going to be there for the use of the lamb that takes away the sin of the world to go and now have a look and say, do you want to see the real deal? Come, and the angels announced and said, you're going to find the real deal, the land that is going to take away the sin of the world, they're in a manger. And so this story again of the angels 
is announcing mysteries, insight, connecting points. And so you have the angel's ministry happening all along. Do you know that, for instance, um, John the Baptist, we don't actually often talk about John the Baptist. He had his own, or you know, rather than John the Baptist, it was um, Zechariah and Elizabeth who had uh, also an encounter with an angel. And wasn't it um, Zechariah, if I remember correctly, Zechariah who then scoffed um, and the angels said, Shh. and he had to stay dumb until John was born. Yeah. Do you know, sometimes I think it's the ministry of angels um, is so important that sometimes they say to us, Shh, not, not another word. Why? Because you see, when we speak out negative things, we actually have the power to even stop the angels fulfilling what they're sent to do. And the angels that were sent in regards to John's ministry, the angels said, no, uh, not another word, because I don't want to be stifled for what I have been sent by God to do with you speaking out something negative and stopping me in my tracks. So he hushed him up. Better to say nothing than all the negative things. So when we speak in this world of ours, we are to speak faith. We are to speak belief. We are to speak the trust that we have in God to fulfill it. That's what we are supposed to speak out. The power of the word and the power of the tongue. You remember all of those kind of things that God has given to us. We see it in Apostle Paul. You realize Apostle Paul had his angel encounters. Even to the point that he had an angel encounter telling him, your destiny, you were praying about destiny. He got the word saying, here you are in a shipwreck. Don't worry about it. Your destiny is going to be in Rome. So here he is encouraging the others who are actually in the shipwreck as well because he knew from the angel his destiny was going to be all the way to Rome. The angel had told him that. Uh, Peter also had his, on a number of occasions, he had uh, amazing angel experiences So much so that when he was speaking the word of God out and the authorities put him in jail, the angel said, nah, you keep talking. I'll just come on and unlock jail. Come on now, just keep on talking. Amazing ministries of angels. I don't know if you've ever had moments in your life, it would be great to actually talk about some of the moments that you may have had of angels. Maybe they didn't even know about it. The scripture actually talks about you know, be hospitable one to another because you never know when you're going to entertain angels. So it actually has that expectation that angels actually are all around us and we may not even know it. I had one of those occasions when um, I was in the seminary training for the ministry and I had a motorbike that was a Kawasaki GPZ. It was the fastest motorbike at that time when it came out. There were faster ones now. But the thing is, it was um, speed, speedy condalis kind of stuff. And uh, on a couple of um, occasions, uh, mates and I, we would go and hoon around, sorry, mate, you know, ride around gently, <laughs> um, the uh, tracks around uh, the, the hills of Adelaide. And uh, the back hills of Adelaide, if you've ever been there, oh, fantastic ride for motorbikes in and out of curves, down the valley, then corner and up it goes. Like, can you see, I'm, I'm still sort of reliving the moments. And one of those occasions, I came zooming down. There was a creek kind of like coming, coming down, very sharp corner. In I go, zoom, up I go, and then all the way up, and there was a cliff, right, and a guardrail. And I'm coming up there, turning into the corner, and the bitumen had been repaired. They didn't do a good job. It was about this much of a lip rather than making it level. So my bike, nicely tired, sort of went in and got caught onto that lip and flipped me straight up. Now I was looking at the guardrail, full lock. My tyre hit the guardrail. My motorbike went straight up like this. And I was looking down the cliff. And then my bike just went back down, stood on the... Oh, back, I mean, not like kapow, you know, it's like, you know, just boom. And I thought, oh, it's not my day to die. Boom, boom, I'll fly away again. (laughs) 
So, I know how to keep my angels busy. <laughs> Importantly, though, is that you have these wonderful characters to tell us of the importance of angels in our ministries. Old Testament stuff, too. Abraham, Isaac, you can read about that. Jacob's dream about the angels coming down. Gideon, Elijah and Elisha. I love that story. Elijah and Elisha, if you've ever come across that where the armies were all surrounding him, Elisha was getting pretty, ah, you know, and Elisha says, oh, Lord, just open his eyes, you know, and he opened up his eyes and saw the mighty heavenly angels all around and nothing befell them. You know, we have um, texts, uh, and I won't, don't want to read on about them, uh, and there's numerous texts all around the Bible. If you go to the... Um, uh, recording of this, but also the morning chats. I've got a study attached to that with a number of the different Bible passages that you can have a look at of how amazing and how prevalent uh, actually the ministry of angels is. So we who are saved, according to Romans, going back to this passage here about the ministry of angels for those who are being saved. So we who are saved, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 17, are called heirs with Christ. We have the inheritance of heaven itself is ours. We are heirs of that. But it's not said of the angels. It's said of us. And actual fact, what is said of the angels, if you go and then have a look at Revelation uh, 19 verse 10 and others, it talks about angels are fellow servants with us. And it is never a time, I have not found one text yet where it says that the angel's ministry is going to be taken away from us. I think we better get used to it because it is going to be a ministry here and now and for all eternity. We are going to be mates having cups of coffee or something, I don't know, with the angels and saying, you know, hey, what are we going to do today? And see what we can do. And we do our thing in the physical, they do their thing in the spiritual, and together we can do mighty things for God. I also know from Scripture that they are so passionate about fulfilling the ministry that God has for them to save souls. How do I know that? How do I know that they, that they're so busy about saving people's lives? Because if you have a look at, uh, let's see, Luke 15, verse 10, if you ever go and have a check out, this is a really cool verse because it says, any time that they, there's a person who comes to Christ, any person who repents and comes back to Christ, anyone who comes into the family of Christ, heaven, angels, have a party. They rejoice in heaven. They have a party up there. It's a bit of a strange one, isn't it? Because when we think about angels, we often think about the mighty warriors, you know, the, the awesome kind of dudes that, you know, you don't want to mess with. And in the Old Testament, every time that someone has seen an angel of the Lord, they kind of fell down and sort of said, oh, mercy me. It's like, you know, they had fear and, and I would imagine they had to change their pants afterwards because it was so threatening, so woe. You can read about some of those encounters where they really thought that they were going to be dead. But here you have this message that for everyone who turns to the Lord, they strip off their armour, they go into maybe a special party room in heaven, and there's a whistle that says, come on, we're going to have a party for this guy. So I wonder, when I died and came into heaven and saw this huge room with all these people, whether maybe some of them weren't actually people that were connected with me in, in some way, but maybe it was also angels all around. Who knows? Maybe the ministering angels. How important is it that we start to realise that what we have here in Hebrews, and let me just share with you a few other ones. I shared with you that we have ministering angels. Let me just read that one again so that you get that. Are not all the angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? And then in chapter 12, let me go a little bit further on. So chapter 12. 
chapter 12, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in a joyful assembly. Wow, that's where we are going to come to. And then verse um, 2 of um, chapter 13, and it says this, after it uh, exhausts us, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. And verse 2, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without even knowing it. That's just a few in Hebrews, and Hebrews is actually quite full of it of the encounter that we have with angels. In real-time, everyday experiences, God is sending his helpers to us. So where do we fit in? How do we fit in into all of this? And this is where I want to have as, as a segment or a segue into the next sermon when we actually explore this a lot more. From a book that I just read, it's called um, uh, Angel Armies by Tim Sheet and Page. 157, it says this. And I'll give you a quote. Psalm 103 says, or verse 20 says, Angels do his command, hearken unto the voice of his word. When God's word is decreed, when it is given voice, by the heirs, that's you and me, we've established all of these things now, angels hearken, they listen to them. They organize to bring it to pass. God created the angels in such a way that they hearken to what his word decrees. We have to understand that if we don't give voice to God's word on earth, then the angels have no voice on earth to hearken to unless God sovereignly speaks or it's a predestined word of God that he has already given. In other words, the angels are already busy with the things that God has said for them to do. That's not, a pro that's not under contention here. But we are now included in this. That when we pray, when we speak it out, the angels hearken. What is it that I can do to help minister among you? What can I do to bring from heaven above to you here below? How can I make the connection, the interface between what is there in heaven, real to you here and now here on earth? And so what I want to share with you today is actually two things. One, we've been given authority in Scripture. Now, I can go and share all of those sort of things to you again and again, but you know, just um, take it. God has given us authority of binding and loosing or releasing. What you bind here on earth will be bound in heaven. What you release here on earth will be released in heaven. Uh, John, for instance, John 20, uh, 20... Two thereabouts. Just to check it. I'm off my head here with uh, just remembering. Vicky's got it. Chapter 20 in John 22. It says that when Jesus uh, rose and he came to them and breathed on them, and gave them the Holy Spirit, and he says, Whatever you release here on earth, whatever you forgive here on earth, will be forgiven in heaven. And the same in terms of what you don't forgive is, is that what it says? Sort of? Vicky? And if you don't, please give a vote. So here's the thing. Even with the issue of forgiveness, the issue of releasing... All of those kind of things, the very things that we do here have a spiritual effect. We have an impact spiritually as the Spirit has an impact on us. So if we hold a grudge against someone and do not forgive, what do we have here from God's Word? It's not forgiven. It's still held. It's bound. When we forgive someone, you remember when Jesus was going around and saying, your sins are forgiven. And they had an uproar. Who are you that you can forgive sins? Only God can do that. And now he's actually saying to us, we have the power to forgive sins. And when we forgive them, they are wiped out in heaven. They are no more. 
And that was only assigned as the power of, of God. But now it's been given to us. Whatever we bind, whatever we lose, whatever we do here on earth has an effect also in heaven. So in Matthew, Matthew chapter 20, um, oh, well, you know that one very well, but Matthew chapter 16, we'll go to that, verse 19. And it says this, Now I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anybody that he is the Messiah. But that was actually then just before the cross. Afterward, he said, tell everybody now. But he's actually given us that. And then at the end of Matthew, all authority has been now given to me. Now go and make disciples of all nations. Right? So, but here's the interesting thing. All authority has been given to me. Now you go in that authority. Go in the name of Jesus, making disciples, calling people back into relationship. So here are two things I want you to think about today, for this week. Number one, first key in this, recognize this truth. God's word is truth. Recognize this as truth. This is, this is a treasure, a truth given for you and for me. Recognize it. And don't become a part of Satan's lie in saying, there is no such thing. Oh, this is not going to be for you. Why is he keeping us in that lie? He's afraid. Why? Holy angels outnumber him already? Terrifying to him. You want to give the devil the heebie-jeebies. Believe God's word. Recognize it and apply it. The second thing is, the second key is, now in your prayers, mobilize the, pray, uh, the angels. Know that you have support. Know that you have helpers. And one of the interesting things for from Penny and I in one of our dark times down in a previous place when it got so bad that, you know, we were going to give up on ministry, walk out of it all, and it's like at the time of desperation, we had, uh, we sort of said, enough's enough. We want an audience with God in heaven. We had a prayer and came into the Holy of Holies and said, God, you now make your judgment call. You declare it. And, you know, I can get, get a little bit more into that next time. But the thing is, and then Penny said to me, no, you haven't finished yet. We need to have volunteers of a heaven army to go and make this happen. We called upon the holy angels to help us in all of this. And immediately the spotlight was put on to where that darkness was on all the people who started to expose themselves and overplay their hand. And I mean, it wasn't an easy time for us to get through because the spotlight was exposing all of the darkness. Boom, 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 boom. We still had to live through that. And then God says, now that we've sorted that one out, come up to the mountain and be refreshed up here and come to living grace and all is well in my soul. But that was a rest- I, I can say this was this place for Betty and I was a restoration time. This was a healing time. We came here sort of walking out of ministry and doing, doing something else, but God and Edgar said, No, we still have some work to do. So how nice it is to actually be here and share this that yes, we have God's word as truth, and we have his holy angels to minister among us. We are not left on our own. We have a lot of heavenly support. And then my point in using those two keys is this. Expect results. Look for it. You know, the funny thing is that Scripture, I think again in John, uh, sorry, Romans 8, it talks about all of creation is waiting as on tippy toes to look for the sons of God to be revealed, sons and daughters of God to be revealed. Why not reveal it? Why not be the sons of God and let all of creation say, ah, there they are, and let all the angels say, ah, there they are. Do you know, I'll just finish with this, a guy called Cornelius, Roman centurion, wasn't part of the Jewish kind of um, culture and everything else. You can read about it in Acts chapter 10. Cornelius, here he was, a very upright, believing kind of a person who gave alms and prayed to God and everything else. And then when you read this story, it is amazing. 
So Cornelius, this upright person in God, gets the attention to, of God. Cornelius, my mate, he's praying. Guess what God then does? Have you ever read it? He sends an angel. And he sends an angel and tells Peter, you've got to go to Cornelius. He's praying. I need someone to go there. And because of an angel talking to Peter, sending them off to a Roman centurion who is praying, that, not just that person, that whole family came to Christ and was converted. Isn't it amazing that when we have ministering angels, who knows whether God is going to get you to know the next Cornelius? Whether God is actually saying to you and to me with an angel saying, look, you've got to go and visit that person. And you never know whether it's going to be a Cornelius moment where God has actually already gave, gave you a word somehow through someone. Make a connection with that one and bring God's word and it changes their life. You want to have a party in heaven with the angels? Get busy on listening to what the angels are saying, where God wants to save a person because they're really keen on having a party. But also, they are listening. They are hearkening to the prayers that we offer. So I think, I'm just basically saying, let's call it quits on Christian unemployment. Let's call it quits and time out on the idea that the angels are just hanging around, have nothing to do on the unemployment line. In my words no longer speak out doubt and disagreement with God, but I speak truth of what God has put in his word, and I claim it as a truth for me. I speak in faith. I speak in words of positive and of expectation. This is a time that is very testing for me. Because in this place, God has given me in one of the nights a word on my heart, and Edgar, being Edgar, so I said, Dirk, you have the gift of prophecy. Prophesy for Nikki." I need you, Bernadette. Oh, I need you. So here, because you're a prophet, you have the gift of prophecy. So here's the interesting thing. And then I saw a, a branch of um, the, uh, the rose, uh, sorry, the um, cherry, cherry blossoms. So Nikki was standing there and there was a branch of the cherry blossoms over her. And God said, when the cherry blossoms will bloom, she will get her new heart. And then I got a, a time. It will be in September. I've only got 10 days left. What do you think is happening to me every day? What do you think I should be speaking out? Should I be saying... Nearly finished, God. I don't know if I'm going to do any words of prophecy anymore because this is obviously not coming about. Should I be speaking doubt? Should I be speaking out stuff that says, hmm, may not happen, so that I will be okay when it doesn't happen and say, there you go, God, I knew it wasn't going to happen. How many times have we been in those places? Can you see where the battleground is now? And it's the same battleground for you and for me. When we have spoken out prayers, when we have spoken out words of prophecy, guess what? We enter into the battle, the 40 days of battle, if you like. And we need the ministry of angels. Man, do I need the words of encouragement saying, no, stay true to the course. She's going to get it. And I believe it. And there were others who had words of prophecy about it too, also for this month. So there are a number of those words that have been spoken out, done in faith, walked out in faith, given in faith. And we give them as our offering to God to say, in faith, God, I believe it. And God is faithful and he will answer. The gracious Lord, you are a mighty, awesome God. With you, nothing is impossible. My goodness me, you just speak the word and universes come into existence. The wonderful way in which you have set the course 
of stars all around us. You just say the word and bang, there they are. For you, nothing is impossible. So when you speak from your heavenly throne and give an answer to our prayers, also, there is nothing impossible for you. In Scripture it says, all good things come to us from you. You are the Father of all good things. Lord, we pray for the words of prayer. We pray for the words of prophecy. All the ones that have been spoken, and we give them to you as all the coals on the incense burner may be a sweet fragrance before you. May there be so many prayers now all around the world that the incense burner is actually filled with coals and overflowing that you actually stand up and see the prayers of your people, that you delight in those prayers and that you will speak your love and favour, your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, your wonderful words that restore us and for Nikki gives her a brand new heart. Lord, we come believing because in words of visions and we speak them out in faith, you are the one who has given us the power, the awesome privilege in prayer, to make a connection as priests in this world with the heavenly realities. One hand in heaven above, the other one here on earth with the people we pray. And just as Christ is the mediator, so you have placed us now as heirs along with Christ as a mediator between heaven and earth. Dear Lord Jesus and Holy Spirit, in your word it says that you intercede for each and every one of us. Continue to do so with great favour on this very special day. As Christy has um, shared this vision that, that we are no longer waiting, we are coming into the here and now, that we are no longer walking around sick, but we will have the miracle of standing up, being refreshed and renewed, and have, because of our baptism, because of what you have done for us, in our Jesus' name, we are brand spanking you, even this day. Lord, we thank you for it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be now with you, shine upon you, shine through you, saturate you with his love, that you will do his will, and the shadow where you walk will bring healing and wholeness and joy wherever you go. In the name of the Father and the Son,